Well, I've been cooking a lot more at home. Recently, I made a delicious barramundi with lemony carrots. Who would have thought? And that's just one of the delicious meals I've tried through HelloFresh. With more than 50 menu and market items to choose from, you can try something new every week. Get 16 free meals plus three gifts with code SISTERS16 at HelloFresh.com slash SISTERS16 or look for the link in our show notes. Welcome back to Hashtag Sisters in Law with Kimberly Atkins Store, Jill Wine Banks, Barb McQuaid, and me, Joyce Vance. In this week's show, we'll be discussing the Supreme Court and abortion, what our takes are now that we've had a chance to digest the leaked draft opinion in Dobbs. Then we'll discuss some of the proposals for restoring rights if the final opinion goes as far as the draft does and how we assess their chances. And finally, we'll take up the other Supreme Court decision this week, there was one, where the court told the city of Boston it could not prevent a Christian group from flying its flag on a pole outside of City Hall that's used by non-governmental groups as well. And as always, we look forward to answering your questions at the end of the show. But before we jump into this week's somber and a little bit depressing news, the sisters-in-law had an elegant milestone to celebrate this week, and that's the birthday of Jill Wine Banks. Happy birthday, Jill. Hey, Did you birthday, have a lot sister. of fun? Thank you, guys. Of course, being with you this year has made this year fabulous and will make next year equally so. And you, of course, our listeners cannot see that I am wearing a gift you gave me, which is a leaky faucet pin. It has a beautiful drip of a pearl coming out of the faucet. So it's quite wonderful and extremely timely, to say the least. Um, you know, for someone who was involved with the plumbers in Watergate and now with the news this week about the leak, it put a little lighter touch on the leak of the Dobbs decision. So thank you for my gift. And I've been, I started celebrating on Wednesday where we have very dear friends are having a dinner party for me tonight. They hired a chef to cook oh, for us. Wow. wow. So that's, yeah, it's going to be terrific. Happy and birth week, then, then we should say. <laughs> exactly, and, You know, yes. frankly, Jill, why stop it a week? Why not happy birth month? Uh, how about happy birth year? Uh, well, because <laughs> it's leading up to a milestone year next year. So I'll have to really be prepared uh, for next year. I, you I mean, know, when you, I'm going to copy you. I turned 60 during the pandemic, so we didn't really celebrate, and I want to do over. Maybe I'll do it for 65. Yeah, that's a that 65 is a good one. Um, 36 was the year I hated. I don't know. Somehow it seemed like that was that was when I was really getting to be mature and old. Yeah, I've never Which, gotten of mature, course in retrospect so I don't is have ridiculous. That problem. Yeah. <laughs> wow, Kim, I wonder what that'll be like when we turn 36. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see. Well, no, honestly, I have a, next year, 2023 is a milestone one for me too. I'll be 50. So maybe we can have some sort of yes. you know, get together to celebrate the milestone. Toast with our ARP cards. <laughs> <laughs> so when is your birthday, Kim? <laughs> Mine's in March. March. So if we do an April, it would be that would be perfect. A Fifty like and right an in the 80. middle. Yikes! Yeah. Yikes! That would be so. Eighty fun. is the new twenty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have any of you guys had any problems with your skin, or have any of your children, so that you could use some advice? from a really good place, like apostrophe. What about you, Joyce? Yes, mom of four here. And, and you know, we've all had struggles with our skin. And that's why we at Sisters-in-Law are excited to partner with Apostrophe, a prescription skincare company that offers science-backed oral and topical medications that are clinically proven to help clear acne and connect you with a board-certified dermatologist who will create a personalized treatment plan that's perfectly tailored to your unique skin. You know, I have to give Apostrophe some credit for the reason why I now am able to, for the first time in years, 
leave the house without makeup on. Like I never did because I was so self-conscious about my skin. But apostrophe in just a matter of a few months is, has my skin looking great. And you can find out for yourself. Simply fill out apostrophe's online skin quiz about your skin goals and your medical history. And then you snap a few selfies and your dermatologist will create your custom treatment plan. Apostrophe treats all types of acne from hormonal acne to facial acne, even chest knee and back knee and oh, butt knee. We all it. hate butt knee. <laughs> and, they treat, <laughs> and they treat breakouts from head to toe. It's amazing knowing your treatment plan was from a real dermatologist and that your plan was tailored just for you, not to mention how quick it is to submit your visit all without the need to schedule an appointment. And we all like avoiding scheduled appointments at this point in time. We do. It's, it's a big benefit. We have a special deal for y'all. Save $15 off your first visit with an apostrophe provider at apostrophe.com slash sisters when you use our code sisters. This code is only available to our listeners. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash sisters and click begin visit. Then use our code sisters at sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. That's apostrophe, A-P-O-S-T-R-O-P-H-E dot com slash sisters. And use that code to get your dermatologist-crafted treatment plan for $5. We thank Apostrophe for sponsoring the podcast and giving us the opportunity to say, Buttony. Let's get right into the biggest news of the week, which is, of course, the leaked draft of the Dobbs decision upholding the Mississippi ban on abortions after 15 weeks with no exceptions for rape and incest. And Joyce, you annotated the leaked draft. So I want you to start us out by talking about what was the basis for the majority's conclusion as set forth in this draft? And we want to stress it is a draft, which means that justices can take away some of the harsher more extreme language, or they can add to it. Um, And some judges might change their mind. That's been known to happen. Uh, But talk about what's in the draft and what their conclusion means for now for abortion availability in Mississippi and in every other state, especially those that have trigger laws or an old ban that's never been repealed, like Arizona. The short takeaway is state legislatures can do whatever they want to do to restrict and even criminalize abortion if Justice Alito's opinion becomes the law in the United States. You know, he writes that Roe was wrong from the start. And his primary argument is that the court has to overturn Roe because, and this is, I'll quote him, the Constitution makes no reference to abortion and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision, including the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. So in Roe and the other leading abortion case precedent, Casey, the right to abortion is largely grounded in the 14th Amendment. That's where Alito focuses his criticism of the court's grant of unenumerated rights via substantive due process, And and the view of the majority in Roe was that any constitutional right to privacy is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision to terminate or, or not to terminate a pregnancy. Alito disagrees with that. And so he wrote in this draft opinion, and again, I'll quote, that any such substantive due process right must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. The right to an abortion does not fall within this category. And, you know, shocker here, um, after exploring a history and tradition during which women were treated as little more than property of their fathers and husbands, and at the founding couldn't vote, um, women lacked really any semblance of real rights, Justice Alito concludes that history and tradition uh, says that women also don't have any control over their own bodies. So essentially, the holding in this draft opinion And the view of Justice Alito is that people who didn't historically have rights don't get to have them today. Of course, we aren't going to talk about all the other people who aren't included in the Constitution, not just women. Um, And maybe, Kim, let's talk about, it seems to me that the decision's rejection based on the absence of a history of abortion being legal uh, 
and going out of its way to note that guns have that kind of history. Um, they used very harsh, I would say, overbroad language that I think puts unenumerated rights like contraceptives and same-sex marriage, maybe interracial marriage, and more at risk in the future, even though uh, the draft opinion does specifically say they're only talking about limiting abortion rights. They're not talking about these other rights that are also unenumerated in our Constitution. What do you think? I think it's impossible to read this decision and not walk away knowing that a host of other rights that are not specifically named in the Constitution are at risk. So Alito tries to distinguish this by saying this only applies to abortion, as you said, because it, it, it involves the protection of life. But if you look at the um, analysis he does, this substantive due process, that's the legal technical right that we're talking about when um, we're talking about things that aren't express, expressly stated in the Constitution, but the court has found to be protected anyway. Um, you can plug in anything and it would still fit this test. I mean, same-sex marriage, for example, we're talking about embedded in a long history. It is only within my, that's one of the few that only within my lifetime has there been a real consistent movement to give legal protection to the right to marry someone who you choose regardless of that person's gender or gender identity. That is really new. OK, but my problem with this whole idea that you have to look at the history of the country and you have to only rights that have been his, have long historical protections are really worthy of constitutional protections. If we're talking about the history of this land from, you know, I'll pick a date out of the air, 1619, the institution of slavery has been in existence on this land for longer than it hasn't, longer than it's been abolished. Now, of course, there is a now an express constitutional um, constitutional amendment that protects people from being uh, enslaved again. Uh, but you could, but just given that analysis, that's why do you think about it? It doesn't make sense. You think about access to contraception. You think about the ability to have privacy in your own home. Listen, some of these, you know, cases like Bowers, it's not just about protecting um, LGBTQ people only. It's about protecting all of us in the decisions that we make in the privacy of our homes from being interfered with by the government. It is hugely important. When we talk about the liberty right, that came from our founders. But when we think about how that is played out in today's world, it is really up for debate. So, I mean, I hope that, shoot, I hope just so that my marriage stays legal, that uh, loving isn't overturned. And I don't think that it will be because that's also based on um, a, an equal protection, right? So I think I'm okay. I'll have to check. But um, I think there are a number of things that will be open for attack. And I don't think that the people who attacked uh, abortion access will be content to stop there. So I think we will see these challenges ahead. Well, yeah, let's, we can talk about what the people who are behind this decision might do in terms of a constitutional personhood amendment that would go even beyond this. But you're right that this affects much more than just the rights of women, because I remember when the case came down that allowed married couples to purchase contraceptive uh, measures, which were illegal before that. I mean, think about that, everyone. But Barb, I'm going to ask you a really hard question. Did the draft for the majority get anything right? Ha. And I, I know I said I'm asking you the hardest question, but but also <laughs> did it can, contain some factual misstatements, some logical errors? Let's let's talk about some of that. All right. So did Justice Alito get anything right? Um, well, he spelled most of the words right. There were some typos, but he did, <laughs> his spell checker did seem to work well. Um, well, so just specifically about factual misstatements, you know, it, it, it pins the whole logic on this idea that there's not a tradition that permits abortion in the United States. And that's just wrong. It really wasn't even on the legal radar screen 
until the 1800s. 1873 was the Comstock Act. There was a member of Congress named Comstock from New York who was on kind of a morality crusade about contraception and other things. And then also as the medical profession became more professionalized, um, doctors associations didn't want nurses and midwives doing procedures instead of doctors. Um, And even the Catholic Church did not uh, ban uh, uh, pre-quickening abortion until 1869. So this notion that uh, our, our tradition did not support abortion is just is just wrong. But aside from that, the reasoning here that I think is so wrong, and it is a problem that I have with all of these originalists, which I think is a, um, a solution in, in search of a philosophy. What they really want to promote are traditional values. And they dress it up in something that they c- call uh, jurisprudence and a judicial philosophy to reach a result that they want and to reverse engineer to that result. So let's take, for example, um, abortion here. When they're talking about these substantive due process rights, which are fundamental rights, which the Ninth Amendment says rights that are not otherwise enumerated are reserved for the people. So there are these fundamental rights that are not explicit in the Constitution. What textualists and originalists will say is, unless the words are in the Constitution, you don't have this right. And we know that that's just not the way the court has interpreted the Constitution. I mean, the right to be presumed innocent is not in the Constitution. The right to vote is not literally in the Constitution. But what the court has said is those are so fundamental to how we live our lives that they've been implied from other parts of the Constitution. So you have that. But where I find the intellectual inconsistency is sometimes when it suits them, they want to define those substantive fundamental rights very broadly And other times they wanted to find them very narrowly. So you mentioned guns just a minute ago. When it comes to guns, they talk about it very broadly, that there's this right to bear arms. And there's a Heller case decided as the most recent case uh, authored by Justice Antonin Scalia. Um, And there he talks about, you know, this traditional right to bear arms. And then an argument gets raised in that case that says, yeah, but, you know, at the time of the Constitution, What it meant to have a firearm was a musket that shot one ball and the aim was really bad. So you mean that we're just limiting to that? Should we look at it very narrowly like that? And with a wave of the hand, he just says, no, that would be absurd. Of course not. But when it comes to abortion, now what Justice Alito is saying is, no, no, we have to look at this very narrowly. And so even if there is this substantive due process or right to privacy generally that might protect things like interracial marriage and contraception, um, it does not include abortion. We have to look at that word narrowly. And since that word isn't in there, and since uh, that has some negative consequences to the unborn fetus, that's different. And so I think it's this broad versus narrow reading of these rights. And, you know, in my view, of course, they have to be read broadly. Um, of course, when the authors of the Constitution were writing it, they were writing for the ages, and they didn't intend to lock in the world as it existed in the 1780s. Uh, and, and the court engages in that process all the time. Otherwise, how would they analyze the Fourth Amendment's right against unreasonable searches and seizures in a world that has electronic surveillance and cell site Uh, location information. And they do it all the time. They don't say, well, we have to go back to the books and papers you could keep in a drawer uh, back in the 1780s. They apply it to today's world. And so this inconsistency... How could they make corporations people? There you go. So this inconsistency (laughs) is, I think, what um, belies the hypocrisy. And I think that, so to me, what it all comes down to is this is just the personal opinion of Justice Alito, that Roe was egregiously wrong. He is simply substituting his own view for the view of uh, the court that existed in 1973. And you know what it reminds me of is a case called Dickerson. Um, Do you guys remember this case? Joyce, you may remember this case because it was a big deal in law enforcement. It was in the early 2000s, the Supreme Court took up a case that was going to review Miranda, the Miranda warnings. You know, this is your right to remain silent, your right to an attorney. Uh, that had been part of the activist Warren court from the 1960s. And the court took up a case at oral argument. They were very hostile to the notion that the Supreme Court requires this because it isn't explicitly included in the language of the Constitution. And yet, ultimately, Chief Justice William Rehnquist, a conservative, wrote the opinion affirming Miranda and saying that even though we have this opportunity, 
Um, if I were writing from a clean slate, I would absolutely come up with a different view. But because of the concept of stare decisis and the notion that we follow precedent, I'm not going to do that. We're going to honor Miranda because it, it's been workable and it seems to work and people rely on it. And so we're going to follow that law rather than change it just because we think it's wrong. It is better that the law be settled than that the law be settled right. Hypocrisy is the takeaway from that one, I would say. Um, let's look back at, they, they refer to Lawrence Tribe and they cite him in some of his articles and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And she spoke even before this uh, about her concerns about the Roe decision. And Joyce, can you talk about some of her concerns and what she would have done, how she would have um, liked this to have come out, Roe to have come out? We had a lot of questions about this on Twitter this week, and I think Justice Ginsburg's views are really fascinating because for her, the landmark 1973 decision that affirmed a woman's right to abortion was too far-reaching, too sweeping, and perhaps most importantly, it gave anti-abortion rights activists a very tangible target to rally against once it came down. She would have preferred that abortion rights be secured more gradually, she said, in a process that included state legislatures. We can now see the wisdom of that. And also the courts. And she was troubled, I think, most importantly, um, by the focus in Roe on privacy rather than on women's rights as deserving of equal protection. So she spoke directly to this at the University of Chicago's law school in 2013, and she said something that I think is important to share with our listeners. She talked about a different case that she wished could have gone up to the Supreme Court instead of Roe, and it was a case called Strzok versus Secretary of Defense. Jill, I suspect you know a little bit about this one. In that case, Ginsburg represented Captain Susan Strzok, who was serving in the Air Force in Vietnam when she became pregnant, and the Air Force gave her two options, terminate the pregnancy or leave the Air Force. Strzok wanted to keep the baby and her job, and Ginsburg took the case. So the Supreme Court agreed to hear it, but the, the Air Force perhaps wisely uh, caved in and gave Strzok the ability to keep both the baby and her job before it was heard, which mooted the issue. But Ginsburg's comment about that case is very telling. She says, I wish that would have been the first case. I think the court would have better understood that this is about women's choice. And that's the heart of her argument against Roe, that it focused in the wrong place, not on women's rights, but rather on this more generic societal penumbra right. I think what we're seeing happen today bears that out. And as an equal protection right, as, as Kim said, like Loving versus Virginia, the anti-miscegenation case, there would have been a more firm grounding, more difficult to reverse. But let's be honest, not impossible for this Supreme Court that seems to get nothing but the spelling right. And that's really a good point because I'm not sure that even had Roe been decided in a different case and under different concept, it would have mattered today, that it would have made any difference to this outcome. Um, and, and one of the things we've gotten another huge number of questions about is the testimony during confirmation hearings of justices recently confirmed and whether that was perjury. And this is going to give me a chance to talk about my favorite perjury case, Bronston. But Kim, why don't you start our discussion about that issue, whether this draft is inconsistent with what justices testified to during their confirmations? Yeah, so it is a very interesting question. And we know perjury is the crime of lying under oath. And of course, at each of the justices' confirmation hearings, they were under oath. And they were all asked about not just uh, precedent and stare decisis generally, but specifically about Roe versus Wade. But if you go back and listen to the confirmation, uh, the answers that the justices all gave during their confirmations, none of them said 
that Roe v. Wade, that they, that they wouldn't overturn Roe v. Wade. They didn't even say that Roe v. Wade was the law of the land. What they said was that Roe v. Wade is precedent, which, yes, it is. It's a decision that was handed down and heretofore has not been overturned. So that makes it precedent. They are all intelligent people. They knew, especially those who had uh, antipathy toward the road decision, uh, were much smarter than to sit there and say, no, no, I would never overturn Roe v. Wade, which is essentially what would be needed to get have any chance at, at prosecuting them for something like perjury. Now, Susan Collins claims uh, that she was told, uh, I believe by Brett Kavanaugh, that uh, it was the law of the land, but that was done in her chambers, in in her Senate, in her Senate office. That has that's not under oath. So I don't. I think people thinking of that. That's not really an avenue here. I personally think that if you listen to anything that these justices have said, have you read any of their dissents, their concurrences? In any case, they have telegraphed that they were champing at the bit to overturn Roe v. Wade. The fact that the Texas law, the even more restrictive Texas law, um, even more restrictive than Mississippi's, was allowed to go into effect, told you that they were ready to uh, overturn Roe v. Wade. We've known that part for a while. That's the only thing this week that wasn't a surprise, right? The leak, everything else, the way it happened was a surprise. The result was not. So no, there's no perjury charge to be made here. Yeah. And, you know, it goes back to Robert Bork, who was the Solicitor General during Watergate, who became the acting Attorney General when the Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General refused to fire my boss, the special prosecutor. And then he was nominated for the Supreme Court. And he did tell people, he did answer the questions and tell people exactly what he thought. And he wasn't confirmed. So all of them have learned. And this gives me my chance to mention Bronston, which says, you can be deliberately misleading as long as it is a literally true statement. And so, as you pointed out, saying it's precedent, that's literally true. It doesn't answer yeah. the question of how you'll rule on it. And in this decision, they did go through why, even though it is precedent, it is reversible because it doesn't meet the criteria for being confirmed. Um, so that is not enough for perjury, but certainly below the standards we would expect of an officer in the court. They could never get away with that same statement in their own court. You got it. I think ben. that's and, exactly right. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's awful, but not unlawful, as Joyce would have us say. If one of favorite. us had done that as a as a sitting U.S. attorney, Barb, you know, if oh. we had made a statement, yeah. uh, we, I think, would have been— Grieve to the Bar Association. Fired, for, discipline, grievance. Yeah, for mm -hmm. failure of the duty of candor to the court. And yet we see these justices holding themselves to a lower standard. Yeah. So a couple more questions. Barb, let's talk about the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act and whether there's a chance for at least religious exemptions um, in the same way that you can get an exemption to not complying with a vaccine mandate. Uh, do you think there's any chance that that will be an avenue? And it may even involve something that we'll talk about in the flagpole case about the satanic temple. Yes. Um, one of the reasons that it is so important to adhere to precedent is because when you don't, it creates chaos. The entire legal landscape is now in disarray. States are going to start passing laws. Um, there are trigger laws in about 13 states and so-called zombie laws that are going to spring back to life in about another dozen. And in all of these states, you know, this idea that uh, uh, unborn life is being protected, I think flies in the face of other religious traditions. So it may be true that Christian faiths, and I'm told not, not even all Christian faiths, but some Christian faiths, certainly the Catholic faith, believes that life begins at conception. But there are other faiths um, Jill, you've shared with me some writings on the Jewish faith, that there is a belief that in the Jewish faith, life begins at birth. I know the Muslim faith believes that life begins at ensoulment, which occurs at around four months. And so to the extent these laws are based on this idea that life begins at conception or that someone even con consider abortion to be homicide uh, and, and conferring personhood on a fetus before birth, flies in the face of some of these other religious traditions. And so I think that they do have legitimate claims under um, 
the Religious uh, Freedom Restoration Act to file lawsuits, either uh, to strike them down or to ask for a religious exemption. Um, and how about people who are atheists or agnostic uh, to the extent that this forces them to adhere to a Christian view? Is this, in fact, even a violation of the Establishment Clause? So I think we're going to have a lot of challenges to this on a number of different grounds. And I think religious freedom could very well be one of them. So while the leak was only of the draft majority opinion, can we talk, Joyce, about what you think the dissenters would say in response to that draft? So I think I'm going to quote my favorite movie lawyer, Vinny Gambini, um, from My Cousin Vinny, who said, everything that guy said is but, you know, I think, um, to be honest, I think that we will see angry dissents. I think that they will point out some of the hypocrisy and the special jurisprudence. I say special advisedly here to mean very different jurisprudence that this majority has used to try to um, do away with abortion rights. And I think that we will see the divide and the dispute in the court aired full force. Because one of the problems with this Alito opinion, I, I don't like the result. I don't like the reasoning. But I really object to the tone. The tone is so demeaning, and it's so patronizing. And I think we'll see the dissent respond in kind. Let me ask you, Kim, about the leak. And I don't want to talk about the specifics, because what we've seen in the media from people speculating is so disgusting, but about what the reason might be that one side or the other might have leaked it. And listening to Joyce just now, a new thought came to my head, which was, you know, in the same way that William Barr, the then attorney general, basically leaked the Mueller report, put it out before the whole thing came out, gave his opinion and conclusions so that it stuck and people came away, that's what's in it, no collusion. You know, that was sort of how we interpreted it, or not we, because we actually read it and knew what it was. But was this maybe to not let the dissents that we've just been talking about get out there so that people would be not so persuaded by this. Um, what are the reasons, Kim, that you think either side might have? Why would the liberal side, why would yeah. the conservative side? Yeah, so if, assuming that this came from the liberal side, um, it could have been uh, both an effort to raise a warning bell, I suppose, raise a warning flag, as well as try to uh, allow the American people <laughs> Uh, the chance to rail against it and maybe convince one of these five justices to, if not move off of their ruling, uh, their vote on the on the judgment, at least change the rationale, roll it back a little bit so it's not as far, doesn't go as far as Justice Alito takes it. If it came from the right, the more conservative justices, perhaps if somebody was waffling, um, it may have been an effort to lock them in, uh, to put them for sort of publicly, publicly on the record because we can do math, we can figure out which five it is since it doesn't include uh, Roberts and keep them from changing their mind because if subsequently it's a softer decision, then they would know who who moved, who, who blinked. Um, I think it is my, and I think that this is really important because I am dismayed at what seems to be this social media slash cable news slash uh, public discussion that has set up that you're either, f that either you think the leak is, you can only care that the leak is bad or that the decision is bad and not both. And that the, you know, for those who care about the decision have to say that the leak is just a distraction and those who care about the leak say only look at the leak. And there are some people who are taking it to that extreme. I think it's really important for our listeners and Americans to know that both things are really important and both things are really bad. The Supreme Court is different. I know someone says, you know, well, c Congress leaks all the time. We need more transparency. We should know more about what the justice does. It's a very untransparent body. It is. The Supreme there is no government body as that lacks transparency more than the US Supreme Court. 
If you want transparency, fine. The way to do that is reform. Yet we had this whole committee set up to investigate ways that the Supreme Court could be in, uh, reformed and absolutely nothing came from it. So that was the time to have the discussion about Supreme Court transparency. We didn't get that. Nothing happened. So what we have is a Supreme Court where you have unelected, lifetime appointed members. And regardless of the reason, if it was done, and this only applies if this was done with the at the by a justice, at the behest of a justice, or even with the knowledge of, the, of a justice, I would say. If it's just a clerk, that's something different, who took it upon himself or herself. I think that's different. But if this had anything to do with a justice, that would be a justice who was unelected, who was appointed for life, using a leak to try to exert external pressure on their fellow justices to either make them stay in their position or change their position. To me, that is wholly undemocratic. That is extremely dangerous. And if that is found to be what happened, I think that should be grounds for impeachment. And it's because you don't have any other check on them. And we're going to talk more about checks and balances, but I just, in my gut, I've been like dying all week listening to people say, no, don't pay attention to the leak. No, pay attention to That's crazy if that's what happened. We don't know yet. But if that's what happened, that's crazy. And we have to pay very close attention to Can I to add a, just a comment on the, on the leak investigation, Kim? I, I completely agree with you about how a leak like that can undermine um, the, the, the workings, not just the perception of the court, but the actual work of the court. And it's, it's a yes. terrible thing. But I also think that when you are investigating, as an investigator, it's really important not to make assumptions um, that you're looking to confirm. It's referred to as sometimes as confirmation bias. I actually have a little piece in MSNBC Daily about this, about how an investigator uh, should go about um, their work when investigating a leak or anything else. And that is you can't presume to know what it is. You have to just look at all the evidence, uh, computers and security footage and talk to people and everything you can find because it's quite possible, pr maybe even quite likely, that it's either someone on the staff um, on yeah. the conservative side or on the liberal side. But it's also possible that you've got people working from home and it's a uh, friend or family member or household worker. It's also possible that this was obtained by a hack. You know, this is the MO of, of Russia and hostile foreign adversaries. They look for hot button issues that can pit people against each other and divide us from within. They've now got everybody at the Supreme Court looking at each other. Which one of you is the traitor? Uh, and they're they're deepening those factions. And so that's a possibility. I'm not saying it's probable, but you have to be open yeah. to any possibility and not just assume that you know where you're headed. You know, this you know, feels I like such an important conversation to me, and I'm so glad that Kim makes the point um, that as sophisticated, smart, reasoned people, we should be able to hold two thoughts in our head at the same time. Because while it seems to me that the lead story here is that the court is taking away a fundamental right from women, at the same time, it seems to me that a leak like this is actually a really strong sign of an institution that's in decay, right? This isn't something yeah. that happens with a vibrant, healthy institution. And the fact that someone contemplated doing this, whether it was someone from inside with access to the court, which is what Politico seems to have said when, when they brought this to the public, or whether it's somebody external like Barb suggesting possibly a hacker— this is what you do when an institution is already weak from inside, and I think it should be a wake-up call to us, that the court, which is an institution, you know, that we praised and that others praised during the Trump administration, the courts were still a place that we could look to to protect democracy. The fact that the court itself is in this condition is something that we all need to pay attention to. And I know you all think that I'm actually Forrest Gump. But I have two sort of Forrest Gumpy <laughs> stories that I have to share yeah. about this. Of course you and, do. Wait. <laughs> I'm sorry. So one is that a document that I had drafted, a memo during Watergate, actually was leaked in the sense that I woke up one morning, opened the Washington Post, and there on the front page was a draft of a memo, and it was accurate. It was a real draft of mine. It turns out that a janitor... Mm -hmm. in taking away our garbage, which was put in clear plastic bags, not shredded, saw it and brought it to the Washington Post. So it could be something as innocent as a janitor 
got this document somehow and gave it to Politico. We don't know that. The other is that I want people to know that this is an unusual leak because all past leaks, and there have been leaks, have been of final decisions, not of drafts. Yeah. And it's really important to point out why it's so dangerous to have a draft because it may freeze people into their positions who might have said, gee, I'm reading this now and the language is really pretty harsh. I'm going to back away from how this is phrased. And that won't happen now because of the leak. But Roe itself was leaked. It was final when it was leaked. And it was leaked by one of my Watergate colleagues who was at the time a Supreme Court law clerk, Larry Hammond, who is also the person who is actually the one who came up with the viability standard. So Larry Hammond created Roe and the viability standard, and then he leaked it to the papers. It turns out because of some technical things, it actually was published hours before the official announcement in court of the Roe decision. But and it was a final decision, so it's different. But I just think it's important that we see that leaks have happened in the past and the court has survived. What happened so to him? So one last, uh, well, he actually, he immediately confessed when it happened uh, to his justice and had to go see Berger, who was irate and who, like um, Chief Justice Roberts, said, we are going to find this person. And he went to Berger and said, I, I'll give you my resignation. I'm really, you know, I'm horribly embarrassed. I did the wrong thing. I'm sorry. And uh, he, he survived. He was mm. not mm. let go. Um, he times. was chastised <laughs> by, by Berger, but he, he stayed and finished his term as clerk. So anyway, last question. And um, is Barb, let me ask you this, because it's one that I don't actually know the answer to. Um, and that's whether states can have extraterritorial application of their laws. Can they punish a citizen who goes out of state to a place where it's legal? Can they punish a citizen for using the um, day after pill, which is legal in many states? If they get it through the mail, it's interstate commerce. So what impact can states have on those two situations, going out of state or getting the pill? I think when it comes to traveling out of state, it is likely unconstitutional. Now, it's probably not going to stop them from trying. There has been um, a proposed bill, I think, out of Missouri uh, to prohibit people from leaving the state. It, you know, If they prohibit abortion, you can't travel to a state where it's permitted. Um, there is The courts have held that the 14th Amendment right to due process does have a protection, a liberty interest in travel. And so, you know, you would have to show that it passes, uh, I would think, the strict scrutiny of, uh, you know, narrowly tailored uh, to fulfill a compelling governmental purpose. So um, I don't know, but it seems unlikely that that would survive. Um, and that is also a place where Congress could act and regulate interstate commerce, because certainly there's an impact on interstate commerce when people are going to be traveling to obtain abortions. Your other question about prohibiting drugs through the mail, I think the answer is yes. You know, in the same way that a state can make it illegal for you to possess certain drugs, heroin and uh, certain opioids and other kinds of things, I think they could just prohibit you from possessing um, uh, abortion medication. And so no matter how you get it, even if it's legal where it's sold and you, you order it by mail, once you possess it, um, then I think you are in violation of the law. So uh, it could be um, criminalized there. And I also think one thing to think about is the collateral consequences of, of uh, criminalization. We see this with all kinds of contraband. Whenever you have a criminal law, you will have criminals who try to exploit it for profit. And so there will be people who have a black market on um, uh, medical abortions and surgical abortions in these states. So uh, I think all of these... Um, undesirable consequences will result from this change in the law. Jill, I've already told you that you're going to have to be my youngest son's phone-a-friend because he's learning how to cook. And HelloFresh makes it so easy for new cooks to get acclimated that we've given him three recipes and told him to cook for the next three nights. Do you think you can help him out if he runs into trouble? I can't wait for that phone call, but I can't wait for you to report on how he does. I hope you get to taste them and 
enjoy them because it's not just new cooks that get to learn from HelloFresh. I'm a pretty experienced cook and I love cooking, but I have learned a lot of ways to make sauces or how to roast vegetables, all sorts of things by doing the recipes so that on the days that I'm not using HelloFresh, I get three a week. But on those other days, I sometimes use the techniques I've learned from HelloFresh. The recipes are so clearly laid out. It's terrific. But maybe the best part of HelloFresh is that you get farm fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients. You get seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. You can skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Well, for me, it's all about convenience with HelloFresh. Not only do the ingredients come pre-portioned, so you're not overbuying or wasting food, but it's easier than ever to get filling meals on the table in a snap with options like their family-friendly or quick and easy recipes. My family thinks I've suddenly learned how to cook, and actually, I'm just opening the box, pulling it out, and following the instructions. Um, And it's amazing. You can pick out your favorites from 50 different weekly options and skip weeks when you need to. If you're going out of town, uh, you can change your delivery date. You can update your preferences all in the HelloFresh app. You can easily customize your order on the app within minutes with fresh, high quality ingredients that go from the farm to your kitchen in less than a week and all delivered right to your door. No one's lazier than I am when it comes to cooking and HelloFresh has solved my problems. And, and I love being able to change parts of the order because uh, we avoid uh, meat. And so sometimes there's something that has great side dishes, but comes with beef or veal or something like that. And you can change it to a chicken. So I, I love that. And you don't have to wait to get started. Go to HelloFresh.com right now. It's HelloFresh.com slash Sisters16. By using code SISTERS16, you get up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com slash SISTERS16. And use code SISTERS16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Or you can get the link to America's number one meal kit in our show notes. Well, we've been talking about the Dobbs draft opinion and its consequences, but let's turn now to some actions that could be taken to help us move forward in a post-Row world. I often tell my students uh, that when things go horribly wrong, and they will, if you're a trial lawyer, a litigator, you know, all kinds of curveballs are going to be thrown at you. So when things go horribly wrong, assess your options and take action. And so I want to talk next about some options for taking action. Uh, You know, uh, democracy is a a government uh, of by and for the people. So um, let me start with you, Kim. Do you think Congress can legally enact a federal law that would protect the right to an abortion? Yes, they could. And uh, there is a law that's already being pushed uh, to be passed by the Senate um, that would do just that. The one drawback, of course, is that if it is an act of Congress, that it, even if they do pass it, which it, all indications are they will not re- eliminate the filibuster, which will require be required to pass it to get it below that 60 vote cloture vote, um, nor will they likely have the 60 votes. Susan Collins made clear that she doesn't support either one of those things, even though she expressed shock, absolute shock, that Brett Kavanaugh was not completely <laughs> uh, candid with her. She's concerned. Um, so she's very concerned. So um, that likely wouldn't happen, but it could. But even if it did, there would be nothing that would stop a Republican-led Congress subsequently to pass not only uh, a repeal of that law, but potentially and very dangerously so, try to codify Dobbs uh, in legislation by creating a nationwide ban. Now, they would have a tough time explaining this whole states' rights thing uh, if they were to choose to do that, but it is it is possible. Yeah, it, consistency is not their forte. All right, so that's the congressional uh, side. Joyce, what about the structure of the court? I mean, can we expand the number of seats to neutralize this conservative supermajority that was 
created by Mitch McConnell in a, in a power grab. I mean, um, you know, we, we talked about these um, confirmation hearings where conservative uh, justices testified they believe Roe was settled precedent. And, you know, the second they had a chance, called it egregiously wrong. Um, is there anything we can do either about the court itself or about confirmation hearings that can help us to address some of these concerns? So there are, depending on how you view it, at least two stolen seats on the court where Senator McConnell outmaneuvered the Democrats. Some people view those as stolen seats. Others view those as part of political shenanigans. Um, But President Biden took it seriously enough that he put together a Supreme Court committee made up of um, many really smart academics and other practitioners Barb and I each had a colleague from our law school um, on that commission, and ultimately that commission did not come forward with a plan to increase the number of seats on the courts, although there are many very smart people who believe that that's the right approach. Our former boss, Eric Holder, was uh, continues to be one of them who advocates for an increased number of seats on the court. I, I think that that approach is fraught. And even if Democrats with the political clock ticking were able to make that a reality, it would still lead to this sort of tit for tat situation where Democrats increase seats, Republicans increase seats. And where does that really end? Uh, you know, the confirmation process which is broken in many ways, reflects how deeply divided the country is. That's the real fracture that we see with all of these issues on the court. So the bottom line is that justices are nominated by politicians, unless there's a better way of coming up with justices for the Supreme Court that no one has thought of yet. It may be possible to tweak this process, but it's inherently going to have this, um, at least a tinge of politics. The maybe more important question here is whether this is a moment that can galvanize Democrats to treat nominations to the court as seriously as Republicans always have. Democrats have never been really great at doing that, but this whole result on abortion may finally be the moment where Democrats are able to convince their followers to treat these issues as a reason that people should vote for their candidates. Yeah. Um, And I guess, you know, kind of lastly, um, Jill, let me ask you about um, legal options. You know, Roe was based on, as we've discussed, this idea that abortion restrictions in states violated the due process rights um, of people seeking an abortion under that right to privacy. Are there other legal um, theories that have yet been tested to be tested? Could other challenges succeed, perhaps, where Roe has now maybe failed? The answer to that is yes. I think there are several legal theories. We talked about uh, Justice Ginsburg and her feeling that equal protection might have been a better argument. So there's that. There is, I believe we've also talked about um, the First Amendment and religious discrimination and religious establishment. So both in terms of denying me my right to practice my Jewish religion, which does not recognize the fetus as a person, Um, but also establishing that I have to follow the Christian belief. Um, The Ninth Amendment and the reserved rights under that is another way that could be challenged. The Fourteenth Amendment we've talked about. So I think all of those are possible. Um, But I just want, I have to add one quick thing to Joyce's answer, which is aside from retaliating for the stolen seats, there is a reason to increase the size of the court. And that is because of the growth in our population, the growth in the number of judicial districts that we now have. Nine used to be the number of districts. It isn't anymore. And that is a logical and justifiable reason for enlarging the court so that there is a justice assigned over each of our circuits. And it would have the advantage of not being one where then the Republicans could come back and say, okay, now we have to to add two more to offset your added two. Um, Anyway, just wanted to add that. All right. Well, I think there are um, no shortage of uh, of solutions. You know, I actually posted some of these ideas on Twitter and asked other people to share theirs. And, and I've gotten tons of great ideas. So I think that, um, you know, this is the kind of wake up call that could really galvanize people uh, to get people thinking and working to um, you know move us toward a more perfect union.
Well, as I sit here in a small, unadorned room, I envy the beautiful rooms that Kim and Jill and Joyce have. Joyce, um, what's the secret to updating space in your dream home? What is it that makes your home feel complete? So with four kids and lots of pets, I like things that are as simple and decluttered as possible. And I also like to keep things fresh, because let's be honest, you can do something really great, and a couple of years later, it's looking a little bit dingy. I'm in the process of updating some of our pillows, and I'm in love with the new Jenny Kane alpaca basket weave style, which will soon be gracing my living room. You know, Jenny Kane Home has everything you need to create the home of your dreams, from handmade furniture and kitchen assistance essentials to pillows and throws that you can pair with anything. They're true neutrals. Jenny Kane is the perfect place to find the items to create your perfect space. Right now, the thing that I love the most is the Pacific bed in linen and boucle. It looks like you would just fall asleep as soon as you hit it. We all know finding the perfect bed is tough, you want it to be elevated yet enduring and able to evolve with any design choice. But it's an easy choice with Jenny Kane. The Pacific bed comes in gorgeous classic colors and timeless fabrics that work with any bedroom style. It's a piece you'll enjoy for years to come, and you'll love the classic California style. And even though Joyce is, is our Southern belle, we do know that she actually is from California, so she knows what she's talking about. Jenny Kane creates instant classics for any room or mood, all grounded in natural textures and inviting neutrals. Jenny Kane has the pieces you'll love coming home to. And you get 20% off all furniture and home decor, plus early product access and much more with a JKH membership. Join at JennyKane.com slash membership or go to JennyKane.com slash home to create the space you'll never want to leave. That's J-E-N-N-I-K-A-Y-N-E dot com slash home or look for the link in our show notes. You would be forgiven if you didn't realize the Supreme Court actually handed down a decision this week. I'm not talking about a leak, like an actual decision handed down on the merits the way it normally is done. And it was in a First Amendment case involving flag flying, free speech and religion, all the hot button topics. And it comes from my adopted hometown of Boston. So Joyce, tell us a little bit about this case and how the court ruled. So the Supreme Court ruled unanimously on Monday that the city of Boston violated the Constitution when it rejected an application to fly a Christian flag on one of three flagpoles that it has out in front of City Hall. It lets groups that are congregating out there fly a flag in addition to the flags that are already flown. And what the court held essentially is that these uh, private flag flyings weren't First Amendment speech by the city. So it couldn't refuse permission to fly a particular flag because of the views that it expressed, not even when they were religious ones. And so it was unanimous on the judgment. But Barb, this decision was split on whether to apply what is known as the lemon test. So tell us about this lemon test. Yeah, so lemon is a case um, that um, is often used or has historically been used as a test in these anti-establishment clause cases. But in recent years, we've seen a lot of the justices say uh, it's no longer good law. It's a 1971 case that set um, this, this test. Um, and essentially, the test was about whether a reasonable observer would consider government action to be endorsement of a particular religion. And so um, instead, what some of the more conservative justices are arguing is, rather than looking at this reasonable observer test, what we should really do is look back to history and see you know, what we thought at the founding and tradition and all those sorts of things, which as we talked about before, it, this all goes back to this idea of promoting you know, a Christian tradition in our country. Yeah. And so you'll see the more progressive justices say, um, you know, you're right that it has not been used as much over time and it shouldn't be applied rigidly, but there's still some basis in looking at it because 
uh, that that's what we care about is whether there is this perceived endorsement of a particular religion. So I think we're going to see more about that. They haven't overturned it, but there is a push to do that. And again, you know, just back to my theory that these originalists really, what they really want to do is go back and lock in traditional values in our country and not permit us to evolve in our standards of morality and religion. Um, and if you do that, then you say, well, the majority of the country was Christian at the time of the founding. Therefore, you know, everybody has to follow these Christian traditions today. And Jill, a lot of people were concerned about this, saying that this decision could make it so that Boston or other municipalities would be stripped of their ability to uh, regulate anything. Like, what if it was an Al Qaeda flag? What if it's, you know, a Nazi flag or something else? Um and in fact, as soon as this decision came down, a satanic group applied to fly its flag under this policy in Boston. Is this what's going to happen now? Will these cities be forced to fly the flag of whoever asks? So first of all, you, I, I was on the board of the ACLU when Nazis wanted to march of in Of course Skokie. you were. And so... I, I love it. Were you there? <laughs> so, Did you march? Were you there? Did you hold up signs? I, Did you counter-protest? I, I love it. <laughs> I went to high school in Skokie, I so I know the community <laughs> and know what a painful thing it was because there are a lot of Holocaust survivors. Yeah. So there's nothing that could have been more horrible. And yet, I believe that the First Amendment means that People get to speak, even if I don't agree, and that I believe in areopagitica and that in the free marketplace of ideas, truth will out. Um, but Boston can take away that third flagpole. I mean, it flies the state flag, it flies the U.S. flag. It doesn't have to allow anyone <laughs> to fly a flag. So if it gets out of hand, there is a way out of this. And Justice Breyer, in his opinion, um, in saying that the Constitution had been violated, said, you know, you can amend your policy. You don't have to keep flying flags. So if Al-Qaeda or Nazis want to fly their flag or white nationalists, I don't think Boston has to let them do it. They can change their policy without violating anyone's constitutional rights. Yeah. And I, I will just add that this opinion was written by Justice Breyer. So it will be at least one of his final opinions from the court, he clearly gave his uh, adopted hometown, home region, um, a, 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 cut it a little bit of slack here and said, you know, you can you can change the policy or we're not going to lock you to this. Um, he also had a little bit of fun with it and said, you know, the, that Boston can't be expected to uh, fly a Boston Red Sox fl uh, flag and have to take into consideration all the offended Yankees fans and things like that. So he was clearly having fun with it. I'm glad he had a moment. I think he had a little less than a day to like enjoy the fun part of this ruling before the leak broke out and, and totally changed the subject matter. But uh, just a shout out to Justice Breyer there for giving a very clearly reasoned, reasonable interpretation of the First Amendment. I worry that we will have a fewer reasonable and clear majority opinions in the years ahead. Jill, what's on your nails today? Today, I have a French manicure, and I am using some of the best polish ever. It's really healthy, good ingredients, and my first order from Olive and June was stolen by my grand goddaughter. Olive, <laughs> it's true. I mean, she came in and she took everything. They were all gone. I had to order a whole new set. Olive and June has everything you need for a salon quality manicure in one box, and you can customize it with your choice of six polishes. Their polish doesn't chip, and it lasts seven days or more. That breaks down to just $2 a manicure. That just makes me think. I'm not sure if my stepdaughter even knows I have them, but don't, don't let her know. welcome to use <laughs> it. <laughs> you know, it feels great to feel confident knowing I'll have a salon-worthy nail polish selection at my disposal, and I can do it all from the comfort of my own home. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten compliments on the amazing, beautiful colors, and they really are beautiful, and the really professional look. I have to say, when I do my manicures, they also last a really long time, which is great when you're busy. It saves time and money, and Olive in June makes it so easy to have perfect nails. We know you will love it. 
And you know, it's amazing because you can pick colors online. It's really surprising how accurate it is. And if you need extra advice, you can call in and they have experts who will help advise you on which is the best color for what you're looking for. But you can visit oliveandjune.com slash S-I-L for 20% off your first Manny system. That's O-L-I-V-E-A-N-D-J-U-N-E dot com slash S-I-L for 20% off your first Manny system or look for the link in our show notes. This week, we had a lot of questions from our listeners, lots of interesting issues and lots of interesting questions. We love hearing your questions, so please do keep sending them to us. We've chosen three, but we'll try to answer as many as we can during the week on our Twitter feeds. If you've got questions, please email us at sistersinlawatpoliticon.com or tweet using hashtag sistersinlaw so we can answer your questions too. Our first question this week, Kim, I think this one is for you. It comes from at Sherman's Corner on Twitter. Is there something that Joe Biden can do to kill the filibuster without a Senate vote, executive order, anything? Yeah, so the answer to that question is no, because the filibuster is a rule of the Senate. So there is nothing anyone can do about it except for members of the Senate. Members of the House can't do anything. Uh, Biden and the executive branch can't do anything. And neither can the courts. That's part of the separation of powers we were talking about a little earlier. So it's all up to the members of the Senate. That's important information. Our next question comes from at Jude Birch, also on Twitter. And Barb, this seems important um, for you in light of this really excellent piece you've written on MSNBC Daily talking about the leak investigation. The question is, is a process question, though. Robert stated he's asking, quote, the marshal to conduct an investigation of the leak. Who the heck is the marshal and why don't we even know there was one? Yeah, this is such a good question. You know, this is like um, it, it, she. Her name is actually Gail Curley. She is a former um, army lawyer, and I could imagine she's highly decorated. Like she's had a very impressive career. But I'm sure she thought of this as like her sleepy retirement job. You know, she's um, she's there to oversee <laughs> security of the court and personal security for the justices. So it's a big job. But nonetheless, you know, she's been like um, overseeing all the legal staffs in Europe and she's provided national security strategy advice to military leaders. She's done all this stuff. So, you know, she goes, ah, at last I'm on easy street. And then she gets this. Um, The marshal is most well known for being the person who, when the court is in session, is the person who actually says, oye, 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 Uh, that's the marshal. But they are also in charge of a security force, the Supreme Court police, that answers to uh, the court. They're not part of the executive branch. So like the U.S. Marshal Service, which provides uh, security to all other federal courts, actually work for the Justice Department. And I think it's really important because of the separation of powers that they answer only to that chain of command. So I think we'll be hearing more about Gail Curley in the days and weeks to come. She seems very impressive, but I don't know that she has in her background conducting investigations. It sounds like most of her work has been, um, you know, being a lawyer, providing legal advice and playing defense, you know, on the security side. And so this is more of a proactive investigation. So she has her work cut out for her, but she sounds like she's very sharp. And so I'm sure she'll be able to, uh, to manage. You'll all want to go and read Barb's piece on this. It's very thoughtful and I, I found it to be very illuminating. So great. Thank question. you, Joyce. Sure. Um, Our last question also comes from Twitter. At Book Jackie says, the grand jury is finally being seated in Fulton County. What takes so long and goes into the process? And this is, of course, the investigation being conducted by Fulton County, Georgia District Attorney Fonnie Willis into the former president's infamous phone call to Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, where he asked him to find him the 11,780 votes that it would have taken Trump to win in Georgia. This is an investigative grand jury. So Willis has her her usual grand jury in Fulton County, the grand jury that indicts cases always in session. But part of the reason for the delay here is that this is an unusual process. She had to go first to the, the court in Fulton County to get approval. 
Then it took about 45 days to summon grand jurors. They had to bring in about 200 people from whom they could select their their final cohort of folks, and it takes a while to summon and get everyone in. So now that that grand jury is seated, their first order of business will be to review requests from prosecutors to issue subpoenas to witnesses. I think I read that there are about 30 people who wouldn't agree to voluntarily speak with the DA's office, including Secretary of State Raffensperger, who's in the middle of a contested primary election. So this process is now underway. The delays are a little bit frustrating, but there's nothing improper or nothing bad to read into them. These things just take time. Thank you for listening to Hashtag Sisters in Law with Barb McQuaid, Jill Wine-Banks, Kimberly Atkins Store, and me, Joyce Vance. You can send in your questions by email to sistersinlaw at politicon.com or tweet them for next week's show using hashtag sisters in law. Go to politicon.com slash merch to buy our pale blue tea, the classic navy blue tea, or other goodies. And please support this week's sponsors, HelloFresh, Apostrophe, Jenny Kane, and Olive in June. You can find their links and special sisters codes in the show notes. Please support them as they really help make this show happen. To keep up with us every week, follow hashtag sisters in law on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And please give us a five-star review to help others find the show. See you next week with another episode. Hashtag sisters in law. Happy birthday, Jill. Wow. Oh, would you look oh at that? God. <laughs> Vouv Clicquot, which is the only champagne. Yes. That bottle is as sure. big as you are. Oh, my God. Is that God. a Methuselah? <laughs> it, it's, I cannot lift it easily, as you can see. I put it down immediately. It's fabulous. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing that. It's going to be, it's going to have to involve a lot of people. <laughs> I'm having a sorority reunion and this is a group that i have known i pledged in 1960 1960 so and uh, about 12 of us are going to be together um coming up oh, this week that's, that's good for several rounds with a group a of 12 thing. from the side yes. of this. <laughs> no, it yeah, really is. i i think so i think that that's what it's going to do is be oh. used for that we'll have a, a celebration well, so I'm very excited. The IOTA Alpha Pi Phi chapter, of which I was president, um, and the president before me will be there. Um, and she was also president of our pledge class. And she has just recovered from some serious surgery. So we can celebrate her Many recovery. reasons to celebrate. That's lovely. So that, well, happy, happy birthday, birthday Jill. Lots of, yeah, I'm very excited about that. <laughs>